they have for us fancy organs, it's got like trumpets all around, so it's just really cool. It says it in the scoring on the top. Oh yeah, California.
Good morning and welcome to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you all on this Lord's Day and a particular warm welcome to any of you who might be visiting with us. I encourage everyone to sign the pew pad, which is the red pad that's at the end of your pew. And if there's someone in your pew, pass it along and you can make note of their names and greet them more personally following worship. All are invited to a time of fellowship in the north entrance, which you can reach by going through the double doors and out to the north. And there's a beautiful selection of homemade treats, coffee, and it's where you can greet one another more personally following worship. A warm welcome to everyone that's joining us via live stream and or who's worshiping with us later in the week as the YouTube recording is posted. And that's my reminder that you can always stay in touch with Westminster through our social media and through online channels. I have more announcements than I like, but it's because it's all good news. It's all good news. First, I want to start off by thanking uh, Chip Staub. Uh, unfortunately, the guy walks around here at church. He volunteers at the front desk. He shows up on Thursday for the, the work crew with a paintbrush, and so he's, he's fair game when I say, Chip, I need someone in liturgy, and he's always double churching and that he is leading with us twice today in worship. So a, a big round of, of gratitude to Chip Staub. This week, we will have the Jewish and Christian dialogues begin. Rabbi Alex Greenbaum is someone I've gotten to know. He is a larger than life character and we've had great conversations around how our faith leads us to be in this community. And he's bringing his congregation from Bethel. The community is welcome and I encourage you to join us on Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock for the Jewish Christian dialogues between us and then also how do we go out into the world as followers and adherents to God's teachings. Poetry and prayer also begins on Wednesday at 4.30 in which we will be reading psalms and hymns written by people just like us years ago. The men's group resumes at two o'clock on Tuesday morning. And then there's a new gathering I wish I had time to be a part of. It's ladies night on Thursday night in which there'll be a group gathering around Richard Rohr's book Next week is Super Sunday. There is so much going on in the life here, so please come and plan on helping out making some quickets at the 11 o'clock time or staying for lunch and all of the ways in which you can learn and get engaged with one another. There is a deacon blood drive. I encourage you that if you'd like to make a reservation, do so. And then lastly, there is a correction in our bulletin. The church-wide bike ride is going to be on September 30th, but that is a Saturday, not a Sunday. I look forward to these bike rides. It's a great time to ride along the trail and get to know one another. Our congregation extends our sympathy to Elizabeth Holtzpath on the death of her husband, John. He died on Friday and service arrangements are still pending. And the congregation extends congratulations and joy to Matt and Nicole Basulik on the birth of their grandson, Wyatt. We give thanks to God for the gift of life and for the promise of life eternal. And as our service begins, I'm pleased to invite forward the Conleys are going to share with you a living our faith. Good morning. We are Sandy and Paul Conley, and we'd like to bring you some news about the progress of the refugee resettlement program uh, here at Westminster. It's hard to believe that it's been a, a full year that we've been supporting a, our refugee family, and we want to bring to you two aspects of that. First, on behalf of the family and the refugee resettlement team, thank you. We have enjoyed overwhelming support from this congregation. Many people have worked with the family, setting up their household, teaching them about life in the United States, and um, the outreach team has supported the project financially, and there have been many, many gifts, both financially and in kind. Your generosity has been so amazing. Thank you, thank you. And the second thing to share is that we're going to do it all again. <laughs> we look forward to welcoming another family sometime in early 2024. Um, this has been a great experience for our volunteers, but some of them are moving on to new projects and we need more team members. 
there are all sorts of jobs. Some take hours every week, but others can be done in an hour or two. Some tasks go on for months, but others are one and done. If you want to be involved, we will find something that works for you. If you are curious or have any interest in learning more, please come talk to us. Several team members will be at a table at the North Entry after this service, and we would love to talk to you. Thank you. Good morning. I'd ask that you rise with me and turn to your partners and those around you and share the peace of Christ. My guess is that many, if not most of us, are just a bit more charged up this morning. In fact, rumor has it that certain, uh, some certain unnamed football team will kick off its regular season early this afternoon at some place called Akershire Stadium. Well, still better known as Heinz Field, at least to me. Rest assured, we are not gathering here this morning for a Steelers pregame pep rally. Nope, we're not. But aren't we blessed, yes, blessed, that we come together with an equal passion in celebration of the Lord and our faith community? In that spirit, would you please join me in our call to worship? Loving God, May we be found and may we find a place where we belong. Welcome us home, wherever we belong, where our souls fit and where our names are known.
Jesus calls us to enter the joy of discipleship, the joy of following in his way. But sin clings closely, and we struggle to respond fully to Christ's invitation. Let us seek God's forgiveness so that we may know more deeply the joy God intends, in part through joining me in reciting our prayer of confession. Dear God, you call us to love one another as deeply as you love us. We confess the times we have failed, allowing our own desires and interests to overshadow the needs of others. You call us to treat one another with respect, even those who hurt or offend us, to work through our disagreements with love and integrity. We confess the times when we have failed, finding it easier to simply walk away from hurtful relationships or flee from the honest conversations. In your mercy, forgive us. Friends, believe the good news. Please now join me in preparing our hearts for prayer. Merciful God, powerful and wonderful, eternally present and graciously close, we are grateful for what you have given us in Jesus Christ, life and love without end. Let us keep the people of Morocco and the first responders in our prayers in light of the recent devastation we have all seen on the TV. Prompted by your spirit and encouraged by your faithfulness, we lift to you the cares and concerns of our hearts, as well as the burdens and worries of our lives. We pray that the sick would be healed, that the broken would be mended, and that the mournful would be comforted. We pray that the warriors would yield to peace, that leaders would gain wisdom and that the forsaken would be gathered in. We pray that the sorrowful would be consoled, that the poor would be lifted, and that the anxious would be released. We pray for children in their growing and for youth in their seeking. We pray for those making new starts and for those nearing a journey's end. We pray for those facing hard choices and for those enduring painful consequences. We pray for those filled with bitterness and for those who are just plain empty. We pray that your church might claim its potential, that the body of Christ might be strengthened by its many parts, and that the work of ministry might be done with joy and thanksgiving. We pray for courage to follow Jesus, for the faith to trust your promises to us, and for the vision to see your kingdom among us even now. We pray for all that you would have us pray, and we pray for those for whom no one prays. We pray all of these things in the name of the one ceaselessly praying for us, that is Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Trusting in Christ, we offer together the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus speaks in sometimes hazy parables, and he upends social norms with beatitudes, all that make us stop and think yet today. Who are we, and what do we value? And on other occasions, Jesus' words ring clear as a bell, and those are the times when we might want to claim to be confused because they're hard teachings. You know, Jesus doesn't call people to be lone rangers. There's no such thing as being a personal Christian or following Christ all by yourself. To be a follower of Christ was hard work back then, and it remains so today. And to belong to God through Jesus requires us to be in relationship with one another. It's plain and it's simple. Now, the lectionary readings over the next several weeks will take us deep into the Gospel of Matthew as Jesus shapes his followers to become the foundation of the church that we embody yet today. And his words will inform the sermon series that we have now on belonging. We will explore how we belong to God through Jesus and his church, particularly this church, the people of Westminster, the people sitting right around you. To set our reading in context, Jesus is walking along a dusty road towards Jerusalem, and he begins with some of that hyperbole that might confuse if read literally. He tells those followers, just go cut off your hand or foot if it causes you to stumble, or tear out your eye and throw it away rather than be led, quote, into the hell of fire. In other words, very quickly, Jesus is telling us to have integrity. We can't let other loyalties or prejudices keep us from belonging to him. And then he offers a very short parable, much shorter than related in the Gospel of Luke, a very short parable of a shepherd in search of one lost sheep. He teaches us to preserve the community by seeking after anyone who drifts away. You see, if God is willing to come to us in Jesus, Jesus tells us, the body of the church, to go out and find the lost because we need them as much as they will need us. Now, those are my two shorthand interpretations of his not-so-subtle teachings about how to be the church, and those are subtle teachings before he just minces no words and lets us have it with today's reading. But before I share that with you, please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for loving us so much to enter into human form, to walk with us, and to teach us how to be loved by you. As we hear these words, silence the noise around that could distract us so that Jesus startles us with your truth as we listen and that we desire only to belong to him and to you. Amen. I invite you to listen for the living word of God as I read from the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking. If your brother or sister sins against you, fault when the two of you are alone. If you're listened to, you will have regained that one. But if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word might be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if the person refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to even listen to the church, let that one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. 
Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I will be with you also. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Presbyterian elder and scholar James Deming studies church history to understand how Europe became so secular. And in his personal life, Deming loves to play and watch soccer. He joined a recreational team with some of his seminary students. And at that time, as he was playing with them, it struck him that he should put his two passions side by side, study religion and soccer at the same time. So as Deming started to, to trace the decline in the churches of England, he also was looking at the rise of what became modern soccer. He points to the Victorian era as a time in which the country's elite formed teams. So these had the elite class had these teams but yet they also then started to compete with the teams that were formed by the working class in the local villages. And by the turn of the century, soccer permeated every facet of English life. These soccer clubs began to attract fans as the church's struggles grew with what he calls, quote unquote, the boy problem. Deming writes, I quote, traditionally, Logic and rationality were tied to masculinity, and religion was marginalized to a private, non-rational sphere. In other words, he claims there was this growing belief that real men don't go to church. You see, at that time, the churches found that once they'd confirmed young men, they slipped away, only returning to get married. So in an attempt to keep them in the pews, the churches tried a new tactic, sports. The churches began to sponsor local soccer teams. This led Deming to discover that over one third of the current English premier soccer teams, those football teams that many of us follow, began as church clubs. However, the church's plan backfired. These local teams offered people new identities and began to infuse them with a sense of belonging that previously they'd felt just towards the church. And people began to lose sight of the church's calendar, the weeks, the seasons, because they shaped their lives instead around practices and matches and tournaments. They met one another in the stands rather than the pews. I can imagine Deming found that they also raised a pint in the pub afterwards. Soccer began to appeal to the entire breadth of the community. Its fans captured both people from all income and ages, abilities and genders, and fueling the growth for soccer. Soccer, yes, it's irresistible. It's European football. It's just like our own football in terms of the infectiousness. So as it was becoming so popular, at the same time, unfortunately, the church was seeding its own demise because it kept stumbling and stumbling with infighting that eroded trust. As Deming noted, this allowed soccer's, quote, rational scorekeeping and masculinity to shine. They were doing well. Turning to soccer satisfied the desire to belong to a winner. In soccer, players are chosen for talents and then drilled to become better players. The sports pits teams one against another to award winners over losers. And the infectious game gives license to divide us as we claim loyalties. And when it's conceived and fun, it's exhilarating. I love going to soccer matches. I played field hockey in high school, and I have spent much of my life baking in the hot sun or shivering in the frigid cold to cheer on a team of a variety of sports. I get it. I understand wearing Steelers jerseys and all the ways in which we're rallying behind the home team today. They didn't see it, but before I was wearing Steeler colors to make sure that people knew I understand. As an aside, it was after I finished the sermon last night as I was watching the US Open, I think I cried before Coco Graff burst into tears when she won. 
We love the thrill of victory. And then I shed more tears when she knelt down and sent her court to pray. She gave it her best. She gave God thanks. She gave God thanks for what happened. But back to soccer. Soccer became just another way to fuel our propensity to rank one person over another, to measure strength and pursue human achievement. That's the good side. But when loyalties pit us one against another in a competitive arena that allows us to become more susceptible to buy into a model of ranking people and organizations with a winner-take-all aspect in other areas of our lives, we become very vulnerable then. When we forget that we first and foremost belong to God, the competitive impulse to can surpass that drive to excel and push us away from people. When we forget that we belong to God, the other loyalty might make it okay, maybe even more than okay, to satisfy a desire to feel superior through a professional status or a social circle or partisan politics, ethnicity, income, education, gated communities, and we all know the lists by way in which we include and exclude. To feel as though we belong to any of these insider groups above all else allows us to condone an insensitivity towards another person's struggles, to belittle efforts when that person falls short, and to dismiss a failure as an inherent fault and they're not good enough. It infects even some to think that it's okay to deliberately hurt another person or not play by the rules just to make sure that you can win. And when it becomes the norm to only celebrate winners and let the weak ones fall away, the entire community suffers. On that dusty road to Jerusalem, when Jesus knew his clash with Rome would lead to his death, he stops to instruct his followers. He knows that soon enough they'll understand that God's love will overcome evil. They will know that love wins. And once God reveals this eternal truth, Jesus wants them to know that they will be the ones to build a church to embody this love against divisive hate. And my friends, given that the church remains, despite dictators and power regimes that have grown and faded away over the last 2,000 years, given that the church remains over any ethnic or team rivalries that might claim loyalties along the way, given that the church remains, maybe the church needs to make sure that we claim the place for men and women to become real men and women, to build the strength and skills that we need in the world that God has given us. The, ch the church is the place to be. Now, as Jesus' followers drew together and handed down the tradition, Jesus also knew that conflicts would ensue in that body of people. He needed them to know that he would be with them in the hard and holy work, and he prescribes for them how to reconcile rather than divide when someone offends. It was simple, and it was clear in his instructions. First of all, don't avoid it. Go direct to the source, share your concern. Don't gossip ahead of time, and don't tell anyone else ahead of time. Go to the one who hurt you or who has strayed. This shows respect for another person and allows that person to perhaps clear up a mis misunderstanding or apologize. And in the process, you might also get to hear what's going on in that person's life and have a bit more compassion for them. If it doesn't work, don't gang up. Take a few, just a few others with you who share a mutual desire to heal and do it in confidence, not to blame or shame. And if the offender persists, in the spirit of reclaiming the lost sheep, go to the whole community, not that small faction of the church that might likely agree with you. But in the diversity of the church, everyone is held accountable and everyone gets to participate in the desire to heal. 
and if the person yet remains defiant, don't excommunicate them. When Jesus instructs us to treat this one as a Gentile or a tax collector, he wants us to see the other person as someone to whom God still extends grace and mercy because that early church knows that Jesus came for them as well. In the community of faith, we also need to know it's, it's level ground at the foot of the cross. We might not only be the one who's doing the truth-telling, sometimes we will be the person who needs to know how we've hurt someone else. And the quality of our listening and responding can either speed our recovery or deepen the wounds. The other thing about being in the church is that over time, we will witness that the people who possess enough love for Jesus and his church to have the courage to confront an offense are also the same people you can call at 2 a.m. in the dark of need. They're the same people who will show up at your door with bags of groceries when your parent dies. And these are the same people who will listen to your child when your child no longer speaks to you. Jesus knows the stakes are high. He knows the stakes are high, and that's when he promises them, no matter what, no matter when, if two or three of you are gathered in my name, I will be there. His presence among us promises us justice and mercy. I hope the weight of Jesus' instructions give you pause, not to retreat, but to know that he's with us in these hard and holy conversations and that his love encircles all of us. We see the other person as a child of God and we invite that other person to see us as a child of God. This way of being the church, generation after generation instills, might I call it, the muscle memory of an athlete to belong to him through the church. And maybe, maybe the church becomes the place where we can do just what we all need to do everywhere. Speak honestly, discreetly, with compassion. Hold one another to account for being a part of the community and not divisive. The church becomes relevant. The church becomes necessary today when we become the agents of integrity and we become the model of good in the community. We become stronger by saying and doing what's right for all of us. And when we look to Jesus like a coach who only wants the best for his players and all of the teams, we can go do what Jesus tells us to do when he pushes us out into those loving relationships because that's what the world needs today. That's why we belong to this church that's why we belong to God through him. May it be so, my friends.
God has so richly blessed us with time and talent and treasure, with a heritage to stand as members of Westminster Presbyterian Church or just those that gather here to be closer to God. God has so richly blessed us, and because of the generosity in this congregation to continue to fund the mission and ministry, we've launched so many new programs for people of all ages to learn what it means to be strong, to be loved, and to be a participant of God in this world in ways that make such a magnificent difference. Because of your generosity and your gifts today, please join me now in prayer. God, we're grateful for all that you've given us and for the inspiration to give forward of who we are and what we have, that others will know just what a privilege it is to belong to you through Jesus. Bless this offering that it is multiplied and generations yet to come know of his love. Amen. In our benediction, indulge me with one short story. Anyone who watched Ted Lasso would have fallen in love with soccer. It was created by an American by the name of Jason Sudeikis, and there was a podcast recently with one of his writers and actors who was a Brit, Brett Goldstein. And they were talking about what it felt like to be in the writer's room, meaning all of the actors and all of the writers are sitting around in a table reading through the scripts, through each episode. I've never been in one of those writer's rooms, but from what I understand, you've got a lot of literal stars in the room, and each is wanting to claim the spotlight. And each is wanting to let people know just how talented they are. And yet in the conversation between Brett Goldstein and Jason Sudeikis, they talked about the spirit that blew through the room 
and they talked about what it felt like to be inspired by the angels among them. So in a place where you think about all of their looking at as competition and all of what they're feeling is competition, what they set aside was everything about them to let the angels and the spirit bring them to create something greater than any one of them could ever do. So my friends, as you go out, your Lord and Savior Jesus has said, when two or three of you are gathered together, whether it be over a cup of coffee or whether it be over a conflict, he's with you. In fact, he's among you right now. And the spirit is blowing through this room and it will be surrounding you no matter where you go. There's no better place to be than in his church. You belong here. So as you go out of here, know that you go blessed by the power of the Spirit, a grace to pick you up when you've fallen down, and a love that never lets you go. Alleluia. Amen.